Good morning. Thank you, Sandy. My name is Karen Cruz. I'm uh, a member of the Worship and Music Committee. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to this Sunday worship on October 18th of First Parish Plymouth Unitarian Universalist. Our service is being recorded. will be available on the YouTube channel or on our Facebook page. The recording will end with the postlude. Uh, then we'll stay on live for sharing of joys and concerns, pastoral prayer, the song of aspiration, and any announcements. And then we are divided into small groups for scintillating conversation and discussion of important issues, personal or international. So, whoever you are, whatever you believe, whomever you love, wherever you are on your journey, you are welcome here. Come walk with us this hour. Our morning worship begins with a call to worship by John Saxon. Listen, can you hear it? The Spirit is calling. It's calling to you and to me. It's calling us to greater wholeness, greater connection, greater service, greater love. It's calling us to heal the brokenness within ourselves, in others, and in the world. It's calling us to live courageously and kindly, to speak our truth in love, and to bend the moral arc of the universe toward justice. It's calling us into community. And now uh, the words for our opening hymn will be the cry, on the green. Building new faith.
My pronouns are he, him, and his. I'm delighted to be with all of you this morning. I invite you, as I light the chalice, to say with me the words of our chalice lighting. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace to seek the truth in freedom, to speak the truth in love, and to help one another. We are living in a time of breathtaking change. When it comes to power and privilege and voice, the laws of social and cultural gravity are being defied. We are seeing the struggle we are hearing the pain. We are being asked to side with human rights, to side with love. I found two stories today that fit that concept of siding with human rights and siding with love. We watched over 150 former US gymnasts face the man who got away with sexually abusing them for years. They didn't simply hide and whisper their stories behind closed doors. They spoke them into a microphone before a frenzy of media cameras and a world of strangers. After years of being silenced by adults who were more concerned about avoiding scandal and protecting a colleague and an organization, these women came forward to voice their stories and claim the justice that for years they had been denied. What kind of strength those young women showed. Do you remember our wonderful shirts that said, standing on the side of love? What a simple and yet powerful message. So many of us wore those shirts with such pride. And then all of a sudden, there was an announcement. The Side with Love Public Advocacy Campaign put out an announcement on January 10th, 2018 stating, since its inception, Standing on the Side of Love received feedback from disability rights activists within the Unitarian Universalism movement. It was pushed forward by a response resolution in 2017, and we committed to change the name because of its history of injury and exclusion and to honor the feedback 
that was being given. The movement is now no longer standing on the side of love. It's side with love. We grew, we learned, we became aware, we took responsibility and we changed. Standing on the side of love excluded people. It reminded them that they could not stand. We even changed our hymn. Instead of being standing on the side of love, it is now answering the call of love. Author Jim Wallace wrote, social change always comes when the next generation decides to no longer accept what the last generation accepted. My parents, myself, my children, we are each the next generation. Each of us has a responsibility to listen to the voices, no matter how small, and take action. There's a meditation written by a friend of mine. Her name is Marta Valentin. She is a minister in our UU faith. It's called waiting. Step into the center. Come in from the margins. I will hold you here. Don't look back or around. Feel my arms. The water is rising. I will hold you as you tremble. I will warm you. Don't look out or away. Life is in here between you and me in this tiny place where I end and you begin. Hope lives. In this precious tiny space, no words need to be whispered to tell us we are one. You and I, we make a circle if we choose to. Come, step in, I'm waiting. The reading this morning is by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In April, 1963, Dr. King was in jail in Birmingham, Alabama after having been arrested in a nonviolent protest. Eight moderate white clergymen had published an open letter asking civil rights leaders to allow their cause to proceed through the courts and to abandon the nonviolent actions that they were engaged in. In response, Dr. King wrote this letter from Birmingham City Jail, some of which I will read now. You deplore the demonstrations that are presently taking place in Birmingham, but I am sorry that your statement did not express a simple concern for the conditions that brought the demonstrations into being. I am sure that each of you would want to go beyond the superficial social analyst who looks merely at effects and does not grapple with underlying causes. I will not hesitate to say that it is unfortunate that so-called demonstrations are taking place in Birmingham at this time, but I would say in more emphatic terms that it is even more unfortunate that the white power structure of this city let the African American community left, excuse me, left the African American community with no other alternative. You may well ask, why direct action? Why sit-ins, marches, etc.? Isn't negotiation a better path? You are exactly right in your call for negotiations. Indeed, this is the purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and establish such creative tension 
that a community that has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks to dramatize the issue that it can no longer ignore. History is the long and tragic story of the fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. Individuals may see the moral light and voluntarily give up their unjust posture. But as theologian Reinhold Niebuhr has reminded us, groups are more immoral than individuals. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the greatest stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the white citizens counselor or the Ku Klux Klanny, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace which is the absence of tension to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. We must come to see that human progress never rolls on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts and persistent work of people willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes the ally of the forces of social stagnation. We must use our time creatively and forever realize that the time is always ripe to do right. Now is the time to make real the promise of democracy and transform our pending national elegy into a creative path of brotherhood. Now is the time to lift our national policy from the quicksand of racial injustice to the solid rock of human dignity. By Martin Luther King, Jr. Stay. 
got to be taught to hate and fear. It's got to be drummed in your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught to be afraid of people whose eyes are oddly made or people whose skin is a different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight, to hate all the people your relatives hate. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be carefully taught. Some of us might recall that these are the lyrics to a song from the Rogers and Hammerstein movie, South Pacific from 1949 in the film, which was released in 1958. And you know, we have been carefully taught. Learning about who is part of our tribe or our people and who is to be feared, hated, and distrusted is ingrained in every part of our lives. And we are so well taught that most often we don't even recognize our internalized racism and sexism and homophobia and ableism. Speaking for myself, even my internalized homophobia took a long time to deal with and to heal and I was highly motivated to do that work. The work of undoing the ways I have been taught to think about other people, the ways I have been taught to fear and to value those who were different, that work will continue throughout my life. One thing we know about the ways that we have been taught and about teaching and learning is that we can always learn something new if we try. Remember the opening lines to our call to worship this morning? John Saxon's words ask us to listen to the call of the Spirit. If we listen, if we take the time to listen, we can hear ourselves being called to something different. It's a call to greater wholeness, connection, service, and love. It's a call to heal brokenness, our own and that of the world. Amid the din and chaos in our country, in our lives, and in our world today, I can hear that call. Can you? It's a call that is asking us to step outside of our comfort zones and deal frankly and honestly with racial and social justice, to learn more about the culture of privilege that most of us live in and the insidious ways that people of color and others have been discriminated against, have not been given voice, have been held on the margins of society. It's a call that can make us feel vulnerable and uncomfortable. And we don't like those feelings very, very much. Part of this culture of white supremacy is that we have been so carefully taught to take these difficult feelings and project them onto the very people who we keep down. If I am feeling uncomfortable or challenged around issues of race or class or gender or sexual identity or orientation, I have learned as a good white boy 
to blame those other people for the feelings I'm having. If they weren't so open or so blatant or so angry or so whatever, if they would just stay in their place, then I wouldn't have these feelings. The call of the spirit at this moment is a time for us, especially those of us who are white, to take responsibility for our own feelings, for our own discomfort, to listen deeply to the voices, the joys and struggles of those very people, we might feel some discomfort around and to embrace their story and their own journey. It's a function of any society with a social hierarchy that those at the top know nothing or very little about the lives of those at the bottom or at lower levels. While for their own survival, those who are at the bottom of society have to know everything about those at the top. Now is the time from the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, for all of us to know and understand each other's lives. As human beings, we've also been carefully taught to conflate issues and not see their complexity. This is especially true among us white folk when dealing with race. You're either white or black, which we think of as African-American, or brown, Latinx, which here in New England, we categorize as Puerto Rican, or Asian, ignoring the multiple cultures, countries, and backgrounds that make up any of these broad categories. I know, for example, that there are many differences between the two halves of my white identity. French Canadian and Portuguese people can at times be very different. I think it proves once again what a meaningless concept race is without also understanding cultural and class backgrounds, country of origin, and a myriad of different social status, myriad of different things that make up the complexity of people's lives. And we will never understand other people if we don't listen to each other's stories, where they come from and what gives their lives meaning. When we are able to listen to each other, we not only find our differences, but we also discover how much we have in common. When I first arrived in Dorchester in 2005 to be the minister at First Parish, I knew there was a lot of violence in that community. I also knew that there'd been a lot of tension over the years between the white community and people of color and that hundreds, if not thousands, of white families had fled that neighborhood dur during the busing crisis. But my knowledge of that community would have been seriously limited if it had stopped there, if I didn't take the time to listen to all of the people I came in contact with. Dorchester, as I discovered, was rich in the complexity of the people who made home there. And I'm gonna go through and talk about some of that. So if you're standing on the front steps of the Dorchester UU Church, you're facing Bowdoin Street. Bowdoin Street has that whole air neighborhood has a very large Cape Verdean community. Cape Verde are islands off the coast of Africa that were colonized by Portugal. People from Cape Verde have Portuguese elements in their cuisine and their culture, and their spoken language is a Portuguese Creole. On the surface, we might categorize Cape Verdeans as black and think of them as similar to African-Americans 
And in so doing, we would miss the complexity of their lives and the differences that, and, and not see them for who they truly are. From the front steps of the Dorchester Church, again, if you go to about a mile to the right, you come to Upham's Corner, which has a large Haitian community. Folks who emigrated from Haiti speak a French Creole and have incorporated some French customs into their lives because their homeland was colonized by France. Throughout Dorchester and the surrounding neighborhoods of Roxbury, Mattapan, and Hyde Park, there's a significant African-American community that carries in their bones the legacy of slavery and was vilified throughout the years of that court-ordered mandated busing to integrate Boston public schools. I think it's only recently that they are beginning to be heard and well represented in local government. Many Latinx people, especially those from Central American countries are miscategorized as African-American because of their darker skin. Many of them have come to the US to escape the drug and gang warfare in their countries. In addition to that racial and cultural diversity, about a third of a mile down Adams Street in this direction from the church, you come to Fields Corner, which has been the center of Vietnamese immigration in Boston since the Vietnamese War. Without really listening, I would never have realized or discovered that there is a large class conflict in the white community in Dorchester. And I see some of it here in Plymouth as well. Long-term residents tend to be more working class, more politically and socially conservative, and express more racial bias. More educated Caucasians, many of whom who are not native to Dorchester, are resented for having more liberal views and more money and for not being from here. I was in Dorchester for 10 years and the call of the spirit to listen more deeply and deal more effectively with my own prejudgments and prejudices reminded me once again of the wonderful complexity of human beings and of life and the glories and glorious diversity of the human spirit. Now, I know that here in Plymouth, we don't have that kind of diversity to the extent that I just described from my experience in Dorchester. But do we ever take the time to listen and seek out and find out really who, who it is that is part of our community here? Did you listen to the words of Dr. King in this morning's reading? I don't know about you, but if we picked up this, this um, reading and it was not identified as coming from Dr. King or from 1963, I certainly would have thought it had been written in the last several months. The themes are the same. The stories are the same. Even today, political powers are railing against the Black Lives Matter demonstrations that are happening on our streets without any word about the underlying oppression and injustice that is being addressed by these protests. Our white Puritan sensibility that we have, by the way, been carefully taught demands order. In that world, we are more interested in preserving what's on the surface than in looking what's really going on beneath. Let change happen slowly over time, we are taught to believe, because 
you know, we get kind of scared and uncomfortable with the instability when our boat gets rocked and our picture perfect veneer begins to crack. But life is messy. However much we try to deny it, we get challenged, our feelings get hurt, and we hurt others. We are rarely willing to intentionally give up our power and our privilege. Yet, our spiritual calling is to bend the moral arc of the universe toward justice. And that, my friends, is a difficult and a messy and uncomfortable and challenging and vastly rewarding task. The time is now, in the words of Dr. King, to throw off the yoke of whatever oppresses us individually and collectively so that we might look at the world with new eyes and see and really see what is before us. The time is now to open our minds and our hearts to wherever the search for truth and meaning takes us and our fellow travelers. The time is now to break through all that we have been carefully taught and relearn who we are, who is our neighbor, and who we are called to be in the world. The good news of Unitarian Universalism is one that can break through as long as we listen deeply, as long as we engage multiple voices, as long as we learn to embrace and welcome people with words and ideas that speak to their souls. Our lives, our wholeness, our happiness, and the future of our world depend upon it. The time is always now. Amen and blessed be. So um, I have to uh, announce I've made a, a bit of an error. Um, I completely lost track of the uh, it, something Deb Keller would shared with us this morning that we've actually changed the words to this hymn because um, folks with physical disabilities don't feel included with the word standing on the side of love. And, and so I, I, I apologize Apologize for not kind of keeping that on my radar. Um, and the um, oh dear, where is it? I'm trying to find the answering the call. Answering the call. Thank you, Deb. I was just looking for it on the stream text. So uh, on the refrain, there are two places where it says we are standing on the side of love. Um, uh, Sandy, I believe, has been kind of changing her words. The, what we are going to try to remember to sing is answering the call of love. I will change this slide um, and get Paul the corrected words for the next time we sing it. So let's, um, Sandy, are you okay about making that change with the words that you sing? Are we, are we okay? She's all set. Okay. Answering the call to love, folks.
one of the prominent signs at our demonstrations, and thank you, Karen, for picking this up for me. Um, I'm going to use the words on this sign as our benediction today. We believe Black Lives Matter, no human is illegal. Love is love. Women's rights are human rights. Science is real. Water is life. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Let's hold that in our hearts and souls as we go forth this week.